Good to go. Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome to today's session, um, Breaking Down Barriers, Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Youth, Homelessness, and LGBTQ plus youth. We'll go ahead and get started for the sake of time, but I know people are still kind of filing in. Um, so to start, my name is Ann Charlotte Prophet. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the director of practice at the Texas Network of Youth Services. Hey, y'all. I'm Alex Polk. My pronouns are he, they, and I'm the program coordinator at Teenoise. Okay, so what we're going to do today, so we'll talk a little bit about risk factors and then for youth homelessness and also for um, risk factors for LGBTQ plus youth homelessness and risk factors for CSA. It's kind of looking at each of the three pieces individually. Then we'll talk about challenges that youth and young adults experience while experiencing homelessness, barriers to exiting, and then finally we'll close out with some solutions for providers. So before we, we jump into the content, just a little bit about who we are. So the Texas Network of Youth Services, our mission is to strengthen services and supports for youth to help them achieve healthy development or help them overcome challenges and achieve healthy development. We are a membership network, so we have over 80 organizational members and then um, a handful more individual members that serve youth, young adults, and children from across the state of Texas. And so, um, uh, and it's across seven systems, so we, uh, we focus on housing and homelessness, commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth, uh, which is also, people call it human trafficking, child sex trafficking, we prefer CSEC, CSA, education, workforce and higher education, K through 12 education, juvenile justice, and health and behavioral health. So we cover a lot of things because, you know, generally if a young person is involved in one of these systems, they're involved in multiple, it's not silos, so we like to look at it as a whole picture. So our work is guided by a comprehensive three-pronged systems change approach. So first we have policy. So we advocate for pol public policy priorities at the Texas Capitol to improve services for youth and families. Uh, our second prong is practice. And so that's what the team that Alex and I are on. That's our training, technical assistance, and capacity building for youth serving providers across Texas. And then finally, partnerships directly with young people to demonstrate what they're capable of when we give them opportunities to use their voice and be at the center of, of services. So kind of like I was saying, here's our policy work. Um, specifically, so in Texas, the legislature only meets every other year. So we're in the middle of a legislative year right now. It's our 88th legislative session. And so Teenoise is working hard at the Capitol to advocate for a cross-systems youth-focused policy agenda. In fact, next week we'll be at the Texas Capitol advocating uh, with our state legislature. Practice, a little bit more about that. So we provide training and technical assistance through conferences, webinars, um, ad hoc, you know, by request. We also have our annual conference every summer, and I'll, at the end, if we have time, tell you all a little bit more about that, but that's taking place in Houston in June. And then finally, partnerships. So this is really at the heart of everything that we do. We weave partnerships throughout all of our work. Um, and this on the screen is our youth engagement roadmap. So we start with um, small engagements, like listening and learning from youth. So that looks like listening sessions and focus groups. Um, and then that goes into storytelling. So giving youth and young adults an opportunity to tell their story and use their voice to advocate for change. And then it, it goes all the way up to staff positions, board positions, um, things like that. So we're very focused on that throughout everything that we do. Specifically, we have our Young Adult Leadership Council, or our YALC, which is a 12-month leadership program for youth and young adults with systems involvement, so across any of the systems in which we work. And they have opportunities to you know, learn how to tell their story, how to advocate, um, really building the skills that they need to be effective leaders in the future. Um, like, for example, Alex was actually a founding YALC member many, many years ago. Uh, and so a lot of YALC move on to, to have positions at, at Teenoise or at our member network. And then, of course, equity and inclusion is at the center of everything that we do. I hope pass it to Alex. Cool. All right. I'm going to try to catch my breath and make sure I'm intentionally breathing. Um, I like to start off the trainings that we provide with a content warning. This one in particular is centered around um, you know, commercial sexual exploitation of youth, aka human trafficking. We're also going to be covering topics uh, around youth homelessness and touching on abuse and trauma. That includes transphobia, homophobia, and all of those as they present. So if you need space, definitely encourage that. I'll be taking breaks to get water um, myself, and so I definitely urge you to you know, hold your own space and be conscious of your presence, and if you need to leave, 
to take that space, hold that space, I strongly urge you to. And then <clears throat> to level set this training, I wanted to provide some very basic terms and definitions. I'm gonna really be focusing on the bottom half here uh, in the conversation we're gonna be talking about. I created a full list of terms and definitions, including various gender expansive identities that I attached in the handouts for in the presentation. I think y'all should be able to access that on your app. Um, so if you wanna look at those, those are great. And then this is really just very high level. And I wanted to highlight survival sex and CSE. First being CSE, so this is the commercial sexual exploitation of youth. We also use CSE, which is CSE, commercial sexual exploitation, to kind of describe what we're talking about. And then we'll be going over survival sex. So this is exchanging sex in order to secure basic needs. So this would be shelter, food, money, shower, hygiene, uh, drugs, etc. And then this really gets us into the, the presentation. So we're gonna be going over risk factors for youth homelessness and CSE. As we go into this, I'll be talking about my own lived experience, as well as you know, some other risk factors that are at play. So how did we get here? The first being um, really just acknowledging economic hardship, which can occur to anybody. Anyone can lose their job. Anyone could have unstable employment, something that's not supportive, and that really can put anybody at risk for experiencing homelessness. And you know, so that's like one of the main pieces we have up here. Familial dysfunction. Um, so all families at some level experience familial, familial dysfunction. No family is perfect, um, but some youth experience heightened levels of violence in the home. They also experience you know, parental neglect, poverty, generation, intergenerational trauma, um, and some families may also uh, reject a young person because they're pregnant or parenting or because they're LGBTQ. I'm gonna get some water, y'all. That like after lunch hit is just like, it's hitting right now. Okay. Thank y'all for your patience. Okay, so next one here would be abuse or neglect. So youth may be attempting to flee a toxic home environment. They may be directly experiencing abuse or neglect in a home, and all of those things can put young people at risk of experiencing future trauma or you know, experience homelessness. And that really ties into um, potentially you know, running away. So youth may run away from home, which can put them at risk of homelessness. And then there could be, along with that prior abuse or neglect, could be underlying mental health challenges that can continue to um, kind of persist throughout their experience, either you know, as being actively homeless. We know that homelessness itself can be, is a really mentally traumatizing situation, um, and sometimes physically, as we'll touch on in a minute. Um, but all of those factors can really uh, be at play kind of as we're seeing. And then, Overwhelmingly, I know our keynote is just talking about the overrepresentation of young people in the foster care system, as well as exiting the juvenile justice system. So I really just wanted to highlight on some statistics that we've seen. So many of y'all know the statistic of, you know, 20% of youth exiting the foster care system instantly experience homelessness. And then additionally, for youth exiting the juvenile justice system, Oftentimes, young people exiting these systems experience their first episode of homelessness immediately after uh, exiting jail or prison. So that's something that we see just overwhelmingly within this. Cool. Um, uh, the next piece we'll touch on is risk factors for LGBTQ homelessness. So this is really just kind of adding a little bit more information to the previous slide, and throughout these next couple slides, we're gonna see a lot of intersectionality at play for these young people. And so for youth, LGBTQ youth, a lot of you have, have seen the Chapman Hall research study of 120%. Um, LGBTQ youth are 120% more likely to experience homelessness. And then another statistic I really wanted to highlight within that in the Chapman Hall Voices of Use count is that 40% of homeless youth 
aged 18 to 25 uh, experience or experiencing, actively experiencing homelessness or are exposed to more higher rates of violence or discrimination, especially for trans people and trans people of color. So I wanted to highlight that and really kind of connect the pieces on how this exposure to violence can affect those underlying mental health challenges and can put young people at risk of future adversity, as we just touched on. And then additional risk factors that we see are that lack of acceptance um, or direct discrimination that LGBTQ youth face. And so these can differ from stereotypical, like stereotypical parental environments. So a lot of young people say, my parents didn't accept me. You know, I ended up living on the streets because of that. But we can really see and like deepen our understanding and how young people may not be involved with their direct parents or their caregivers. Young people could be kind of exposed to lack of acceptance as early as you know, middle school, elementary school, as well as in the juvenile justice system, in shelters, or in foster placements. And so it allows us to see that there's really no one pipeline for young people to be introduced into homelessness or experience their first episode of homelessness. Need another? Okay, I'm just gonna hold on to this. Um, so the last one I wanted to highlight here is difficulty accessing services. So, so this is something I personally experienced. It can be extremely difficult to access services while you're experiencing homelessness as well as before the experience of homelessness. My family never had insurance. That was never an option for us and being Disabled, it was extremely difficult to be able to access healthcare as well as mental health care. And uh, additionally, like accessing gender care was just not an option for me. I'm a trans person, I should have disclosed that. Um, but I mean, these barriers are very much real uh, for young people, especially BIPOC youth who are kind of exposed to vulnerabilities from the jump, it, just healthcare and accessing adequate care is just um, really pervasive amongst youth and LGBTQ youth as they attempt to navigate their experience. Okay, so we're gonna go into risk factors and vulnerabilities for CSE, so commercial sexual exploitation and the disproportionate impacts that it has on you know, these, these young people. And so lack of financial, familial, community, housing, food, medical stability can increase risk of sexual exploitation. And so some examples of these risk factors would include familial disruption. So you've seen this in the previous two slides. You know, this is just generally a, like a risk factor for young people for being exploited. So this dysfunction can be as a result of lack of acceptance, the neglect, uh, the abuse that we talked about and other um, factors that can create unmet needs for young people for exploiters to then come in um, and prey on those unmet needs. So prior abuse and trauma, uh, we spoke on this pretty well, so I won't uh, divulge too much information, but there is a statistic that from West Coast Children's Clinic that I wanted to highlight, and that is over 50% of commercially sexually exploited youth experience abandonment by their family or primary caregiver or inadequate supervision. And this you know, often generates those underlying unmet uh, health needs. Mental health needs. So, the exploitation in and of itself can create compounding complex trauma, which can put young people at risk of further experiencing CSA, as well as being unable to really figure out how to escape the life and escape that experience. And so mental health needs really is just tied into all three of these points that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make here. And housing instability. So this is a primary risk factor for CSA. The keynote also um, that we had here was kind of explained that connection, and it's just such a clear pipeline for young people to, you know, whenever they experience that housing insecurity, become exploited. Either they need somewhere to go, they don't have anyone else to go to, and running away from home or care is also uh, a risk factor whenever we're thinking about 
where young people are going as soon as they kind of leave their home. And let me see the statistic. There's statistics that show that runaways are approached by traffickers within 48 hours of running away from home. And often traffickers will stay outside of a care facility or building, you know, waiting for these young people to exit so they can begin the process of grooming and exploitation. And if anybody has any questions at any point, please let me know, you know, raise your hand and, and we can have a dialogue. I'm definitely open to having those conversations. And it's pretty warm. Um, I wanted to also speak on child welfare involvement. Same thing with youth homelessness. You know, that child welfare involvement directly affects young people um, who are at risk. Like I mentioned before, you know, exploiters will park outside of facilities or care facilities, um, homes to, you know, directly engage with young people to, in order to um, exploit them, traffic them. And it shows that 80%, the, this West Coast study, excuse me, shows that 86% of exploited youth screen had involvement with the child welfare system, and 80% had involvement with the juvenile justice system. So we can really see just how all of this just intertwines. Gender and LGBTQ+. So I want to explain this in the, in the best way possible, because it can be, it's kind of difficult to, for me at least, when I was looking at this, like, why is being LGBTQ plus like a risk factor? Um, and so we've seen in the past how female identified youth seem to be at higher risk of CSA, and it may be whether or it may be whether or not we're we're better at recognizing CSA amongst women and girls. Um, but LGBTQ youth and trans youth may be up to five times more likely to experience sexual exploitation and you know need increased needs or services. And so this isn't because of their identity or their orientation, but because of the common experiences that may have and like that they may have, including community rejection, um, isolation, or just general lack of supports. And so to speak on that further, the daily you know, impacts of social inequities that I mentioned are exacerbated for young people, for queer youth, as well as uh, people of color, and that inc dra drastically increases the risk of CSA. So while any child, regardless of characteristics, can be exploited, um, culture, systemic equalities, and other dynamics create more vulnerabilities for certain populations. Um, this doesn't just include um, you know, young people who are queer, but racism, poverty, immigration status, and ability uh, all impact the protection and opportunity and voice for young people to receive services, um, as well as like create, can create additional vulnerabilities um, than others. Okay, cool. I'll pass it over to Anne Charlotte to talk about pathways. Okay, so with that, kind of after looking at risk factors, now we'll talk a little bit about the pathways that actually, you know, can lead into commercial sexual exploitation, right? Because any risk factor doesn't mean that you're going to be exploited or it's going to happen. Um, so the first one on here, I think, is, is a pretty familiar one. It's called Romeo exploitation, sometimes called uh, lipstick exploitation. And this is uh, exploitation by someone who poses as a romantic partner. A lot of times it'll be a slow process. You know, they'll, they'll promise love, affection, attention, and then it'll slowly kind of build into something else. Um, the next one, gorilla exploitation. So I think this is the one that, you know, any layperson, if you ask them to explain exploitation, they'll talk about this, right? Kind of the taken narrative, um, you know, coercion, force, um, a little bit more violent and aggressive. The next one that's really common is peer-to-peer uh, -peer exploitation. And so this one is a tactic that involves other youth. And it's really complex because you're not only, you know, trying to address the young person who's being exploited, but also the young person who has recruited them into it. And kind of, you know, we have to be really cognizant of the power structure that that creates and the kind of trauma that that child also has or that youth also has for, you know, the, the harm that they might have kind of helped to bring on to, to their peer. Um, this also leads into the next one, which is gang-based recruitment. So both peer-to-peer -peer and gang-based recruitment can um, offer a lot of, um, like, 
love and acceptance and, and um, kind of a sense of community, right? Like someone says, hey, join us, come be with us. And, and it can feel good at first. This is something that's actually really common in the LGBTQ plus community, especially where you know someone maybe hasn't been able to find their niche, hasn't been able to find their, their spot. Uh, I think especially you know in places like Texas where it can be a little bit less accepting, that can be really prevalent, right? And so finding a community that accepts you and loves you, right? It can feel really, really good. And you're like, this is you know so much better than anything I've experienced before. Um, and so gang-based can also have that, but then there's also kind of the gorilla side of gang-based, so it can be either way. Uh, the next one is internet enticement. So this one is getting more and more common as it you know, just becomes really easy for an exploiter to get on there and pose as somebody that they're not. They can hide their identity. They can you know, kind of pretend to be somebody different. And you know, a young person can be on the internet from anywhere, on their phones, you know, at their homes. And so that one's a really big one that we're seeing more of. Uh, and then the next is illicit sexually oriented businesses. So this includes things like massage parlors, um, you know, escort services, but can also be jobs that seem too good to be true, right? Like um, someone gets, you know, a gig to be a model, and so they're taking pictures, and then, you know, it slowly escalates into maybe videos, and then it escalates into clients, and so it can kind of be a, a slow grooming process. And then the last one, of course, that Alex talked a little bit about is survival sex, um, and this is when a young person trades, you know, sexual activity for, you know, something that they need, so that can be a basic need like housing, food, shelter, but it can also be, you know, love and acceptance and, um, you know, kind of that sense of community again. And, and this is sexual exploitation as far as we're concerned. That person who is benefiting from that is exploiting that young person. And so in all of these cases, there's usually a grooming period where, you know, it's not like, it, a lot of times it's not that first time the young person's being exploited. It's really more like slowly boiling the frog. Have all heard that expression where, you know, when the frog is in the boiling water? Yeah, question? For us, I feel like, I mean, the way we look at it doesn't personally, right? It's like someone doesn't suddenly change when they turn 18. And so that's why we, you know, talk about commercial sexual exploitation of youth, right? And kind of looking at, at young people up to, you know, 24, 25, 26 as their brains continue to develop. In terms of the law, there is differences um, and it varies state by state. In Texas, it's under 18 or minors. And so they have a lot more protections. The definition of tra uh, sex trafficking is much broader than it is for, for adults. Um, you have to prove force, fraud, or coercion for adults in Texas. Um, I know there's a federal definition, and I think it kind of lines up with that, but it varies state by state. But for most of these, in terms of kind of the pathways, they're pretty similar. I think the sexual oriented business and survival sex are the two that probably vary the most, depending on if you're a minor or not, because of that. When you're a minor, you can't legally consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're gonna kind of step back a little bit and talk just briefly about trauma and adversity. Um, I know that we get a lot of training on all of this, but we just wanna make sure that we kind of have a level, level playing field here um, and you know, really understand all these traumas and risk factors that can happen before a young person is ever exploited. And so you know, when a young person's needs go unmet, um, that's when they can be exposed to adversities that lead to trauma that can then you know, set them up to, to be exploited. So this first one, so adversity and trauma. So adversity is the event itself. So adversity is what happens to you, you know, and it can be in a community, it can be in the home, it can be in the school environment. Um, you know, many of the risk factors that Alex was just talking about are, are adversities. And then trauma is the overwhelming nature of the event or the repeated events that, that happen from an adversity and the harm that it creates for a person. And so trauma isn't um, objective. Right, is that the right one? I always forget which one's subjective, which one's objective. Trauma, trauma can be different for everybody. Like you and I could go through the same experience and it could be traumatic for me and not for you, and that doesn't make either of us invalid, right? Like it's that trauma is just how it impacts you and your your regulational system and, and the way that you experience it. Um, and again, it, it overlaps a lot with a lot of systemic and cultural and, and contextual things as well. Um, and so looking at this graph, so I think most of us are really familiar with adverse childhood experiences, which is the top of this, kind of the fruit of the trees, right? So this is things, you know, like that might happen in a child or an adolescent's life, you know, exposure to abuse and neglect, um, uh, unstable caregiving, addiction, substance use in the home, 
things like that. Um, and all of those, the ACEs studies show, are very, very closely tied to poor negative life outcomes from health to behavioral health to employment and even life expectancy. Um, but then I, we really think it's important to also think about kind of the, the roots of the tree in this, in this image, which are what we call the adverse community environments. And so these are more of the systemic issues, right, that, that can impact somebody like discrimination, racism, violence, lack of opportunity, um, you know, lack of power, right? Power dynamics can play a huge role. And so it's really, really important to kind of think about all of these concepts together and the way that they can, they can impact each other. And, you know, it's, I mean, intersectionality, right, is, is kind of what we're talking about here. That anybody can, you know, what is it? I'm going to read this one directly. Um, you know, so whether a child comes from adverse or affluent communities, they can be vulnerable, you know, based on the convergence of factors. Um, we just have to be, be cognizant of all of them and the way they come together. But it's also important to know that, you know, just because somebody's had adverse experiences, it doesn't mean that, you know, they're doomed or they're going to, you know, be dealing with trauma for their whole life or they're going to be exploited, right? Um, you know, humans have a lot of resilience and there's a lot that we can do to support them and, and help them get through it, you know, in a way where they can really heal. So it's not, not doomsdayist at all when, when we're talking about this. Okay, so the effects of trauma. So I really love the way that Karen Purvis describes this, and she is the founder of Trust-Based Relational Intervention, which is um, an evidence-based approach to, to trauma-informed care. Um, Karen Purvis is in Texas, out of Texas Christian University. So in Texas, we're big fans of TBRI. Um, so she talks about the effects of trauma using the five Bs. So the first B is the brain. So trauma literally rewires your brain. It rewires the way that your, your neurons fire. Um, and this, in turn, can impact your life. It can impact the way someone develops. Um, you know, it can impact long-term health and your ability to care for yourself or for others. The next one is the body. So trauma can alter our sensory experiences. I mean, I think, you know, we've all had those moments where we're really anxious and you can feel it in your stomach, right? So it's that on a much bigger scale. Um, so it can impact, you know, the way that, that we feel things, kind of the way that we respond to things. The next one is beliefs themselves. So trauma can impact the, um, someone's belief about themselves, like their self-awareness, self-esteem, self-regulation. Um, but it can also shape your beliefs about safety and, and what is safe and what is harmful. A lot of times we see that, that you know, young people who have been exploited might kind of have their, their ideas of safety and, and harm swapped, right? They might see their exploiter as their safety, as somebody who's providing for them and keeping them safe. And then they see us as the providers, as the interloper, the person who's trying to take them away from something that's, that's given them kind of, you know, maybe a purpose or feeling of love or, or something that's, that's missing. The next one is biology itself. So we're learning more and more about the intergenerational effects of trauma and the way that trauma can literally impact your gene expression um, that can have lasting effects for multiple generations. Um, and so that's also something that's really important to keep in mind, especially when we're looking at, you know, factors like racism, poverty, um, you know, and, and historical discrimination, that, that it's going to take multiple generations to, to, harm, to fix the harms that we've created in our society. Um, and then lastly is behavior. So um, I think, you know, as, as service providers, we all know that, that trauma can um, show itself in behaviors itself. Um, a lot of children who have trauma, you know, end up with diagnoses of anxiety, depression, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, reactive attachment disorder, you know, et cetera, so that there's um, a lot of behavioral responses to trauma as well. Okay, and so kind of thinking about the risk factors, we want to take a minute to, to do a quick activity um, kind of on the concept of choice. And so we borrowed this slide from West Coast Children's Clinic, so I want to give them full credit. Um, but so a lot of times when we are talking about commercial sexual exploitation, it's framed as a choice that someone is making, right? Like, she didn't have to meet up with him, you know, they didn't have to, to you know, answer that phone call or, you know, go to that, that bar, or whatever it is. Um, but it's really important to remember that it's not a choice. For minors, they literally can't consent. And for people who aren't minors, there's still a lot of factors that are at play, you know, that we need to kind of keep in mind. Um, you know, sometimes a young person might even tell you that, that it's their choice, right? And that can be because they're trying to make sense of it. They're trying to feel control over a situation, right? I mean, we've all done that, right? You do something and you're just like, I meant to do that. It's fine. Like, I meant to do it, right? Um, and so they actually, like, fully believe that um, when it's happening. Um, 
what else? You know, they might do it to kind of try to make sense of an, a confusing experience, right? Like, why is this happening? Oh, I did it. I can get out whenever I want. You know, I want to be here. Um, you know, and, and again, there's also a lot of that survival sex in there where a young person might say, yeah, I chose to do that because I needed somewhere to stay. I needed a shower. Um, they were my, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my partner. Um, and again, that is survival sex, which we believe is, is exploitation, that that child or youth is being exploited. Um, so looking at this activity, so take a moment either with the person next to you on a piece of paper in the chat for the virtual folks um, and, and ans try to answer some of these questions. So there's, would you rather not be able to trust anyone or trust everybody always? Would you rather lose all of your memories from birth until now or lose your ability to make new long-term memories? Would you rather relive the same day for 365 days or lose a year of your life? Would you rather be alone forever or always have people around? Would you rather be constantly tired or constantly hungry? So you don't have to answer everyone, but just take a few moments to kind of think about these, you know, with your neighbor, and then we'll come back. <laughs> okay, y'all are quieting down a little bit. Does anyone want to raise their hand? I can run you the mic um, to kind of share what y'all talked about, what choices you made, how that went. No, y'all had so much, so much conversation. Nobody wants to share. Okay. I'll just say that we said we didn't want to answer any of them. Like they were, they were all terrible. Um, especially the first one, like seemed like, whoa, that's. I mean, I, I mean, none of them wanted to be answered. Um, and so it was really just talking about what that actually like looks like. Like, would you lose? Uh, would you get to pick the year that you lose, or is it just like the first year of your life? So like, I think it matters a lot of details about it. But the reality is, is that these aren't choices. So. Yeah, you said that perfectly. Does anyone else um, want to want to share kind of what they talked about? Uh, we had kind of the same stance on all of them are just lesser of two evils kind of questions. Um, I also realized while reading through them, a lot of these are just my reality already, and so I found it very difficult to make the choice because for myself and some other people. Um, the choice is kind of automatically already made. Like the, the first one we spoke about, how like it would be easier and feel safer to choose not trusting anyone rather than trusting everybody always. Because safety, you know, you can't get hurt if you don't trust anyone. And, but like as I had said, like safety and isolation often become synonymous on accident or by force. Um, so very much lesser than two evils. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thanks y'all, right? So, I mean, these suck, right? Just straight up, like this is like, yeah, it's, 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 they're not good choices. You can't make that choice. I don't wanna make feedback, so I'm like trying to switch around the mics. Um, 
right? So I mean, these are they're they're impossible, um, and I think it's really important to consider that when we're working with young people who've experienced trauma, and especially young people who have been exploited, that these are the kind of choices they've been given from day, like you said, from you know from day one, they they've been given choices that just it's not fair, it sucks, it's there's no good choice here, um, and so I will pass it to Alex. Okay, so now we're gonna go into uh, challenges while experiencing homelessness. Um, the best way that I can like even describe my own challenges was kind of like through just the understanding of what basic human needs are because often I feel like my experience with homelessness or my experience with exploitation was just kind of like separate and I have trouble or I had trouble in the beginning especially to understand that my needs weren't, you know, out of the ordinary, like it was just, I was trying to meet basic human needs. And so that's the way I like to have these conversations, especially when we're kind of peppering in pieces about LGBTQ youth, like I could do this, or I could create a whole other slide about the unique needs of LGBTQ youth, but I would just rather have a, a basic conversation around why it's all important. So I'm referring to Maslow's hierarchy of needs here, because we can really see just the, the general experience of these basic human needs, so housing, food, water, warmth, shade, physical safety, um, which are all necessary in you know, the ultimate survival of a human being. I highlighted warmth and shade specifically just to give kind of honor to my own, my own lived experience. And you know, when I was initially homeless, I had just kind of escaped conversion therapy, and I was living, living out of my car, I moved from Conversion therapy was in California. I was living in New Braunfels, Texas, and then I moved up to Austin, Texas. Um, I didn't have AC in my car. And so when you know I was experiencing the dead summer, Austin, Texas, we're talking uh, 105, you know, upwards. Um, I got heat exhaustion, heat stroke very commonly. Like it was just an overwhelming experience for me. And um, so in this case, I really wanted to highlight just like how temperature can, can really play and just the impact of youth experiencing homelessness, the impact of long-term heat exposure or hypothermia, all of those things really play on each other. So that's something that I wanted to specifically speak on. Um, additionally, just understanding and like speaking on my own experience, there was not a time that you know I sat in my car and I was like, oh, this is good, I'm fine. Like, I would do anything, anything to be out of that situation. I would, yeah, I, I would do anything. And so that's where like the pathway went to my experience with survival sex. Like, I just needed a shower. I needed somewhere I could wash my chest compression binder. I needed somewhere I could, you know, be out of the damn heat, like it was just, it was, it was a big challenge and this is something that young people experiencing homelessness, young people on the street have to deal with and have to navigate every day. And then when we, we know that like, there's no going up in the Maslow's hierarchy if you don't get your basic needs met. So already, anything above meeting your basic needs, meeting emotional needs, meeting those psychological needs, impossible nearly impossible. We can sure try. Um, and you know, to expand on that further, you know, all humans need to feel as though they belong and that they have a sense of community. And so for youth experiencing homelessness and LGBTQ youth, this lack of need is especially present, especially also for young people who experience trauma, housing, uh, housing instability, or um, you know, abuse in their early childhood. And so youth may just not have access to get those supportive services to kind of help navigate those challenges or help bolster that sense of community that they're, they're needing, that all humans need. And so it may be difficult to get supportive therapy while you're experiencing homelessness. It may be difficult to um, 
get healthcare access in general, um, get gender care, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, tr young people, especially trans youth, um, need access to appropriate, you know, either things for their, to align with their gender identity, whether that's a binder, a gaff, you know, all of the, the tools that are helpful for trans youth to um, feel secure and feel safe, but also hormone uh, replacement therapy, if that's what they choose, um, all of those things can be life-saving or are life-saving and sh should be available to young people um, and youth to have access to those things in a safe way. Because otherwise, if we do not have access to those things, we will seek them out. We will try what, to do whatever we can to meet those basic needs. And that can put young people at risk of experiencing further trauma or really give be the ticket for exploiters to kind of prey on those unmet needs and be like, look, I'm going to be there to, to meet all of those needs, to give you hormones or to, to do all of those things. So important to keep in mind. OK, so touching on additional factors that can create vulnerabilities. So firstly, the criminalization of homelessness. So I'm talking camping bans, uh, something we really saw in Austin in the, in the last couple years. Camping bans can create added barriers and lead to the suburbanization of homelessness, pushing young people out of inner cities where the services are often located into more rural areas where they're unable to have access to adequate housing, transportation, et cetera. Um, it also can create further involvement in the juvenile justice system. So if young people are being arrested for uh, camping or, or hanging out in an area that um, they're not legally allowed to, you know, that can create direct involvement in the juvenile justice system, um, as well as some other factors that I was wanting to touch on on this piece. Oh, um, survival crimes. So survival crimes such as, you know, like I mentioned, you're like staying in a, like an abandoned building or engaging in sex, you know, if you're charged with prostitution, all of those things can be considered survival crimes and can put young people at extended risk of ju uh, justice involvement um, and be put into the incarceral system. Evictions. Uh, I hate this. I, I personally experienced eviction um, after my transitional living pro program closed down, so I had to um, I was put into an apartment that I ultimately was not able to afford and being disabled, I wasn't able to get transportation to a job after a while and then was ultimately evicted and I still, you know, face the, the challenges of that eviction and I will until 2026. And so young people who experience evictions or anybody who experiences evictions has to find alternative uh, housing arrangements, whether, you know, through direct, like a through other organizations that can provide that housing, often located in unsafe parts of town, or can create additional you know, vulnerabilities as far as how you can access that. Long wait list, all of you may have heard, heard of these things. Um, but evictions can continue and do continue to affect young people um, experiencing homelessness and then can create and compound that cycle of homelessness. Okay, and then, Location of services, I touched on that. You know, if young people are be push, being pushed in rural areas, they may not have access to transportation to get services met, or even if they are in a urban area, they may not have access to bus systems or transportation otherwise, you know, bus passes, et cetera. So all of those things can create additional barriers. And then limited access to healthcare. So, Lack of affordable medical, mental health care um, is a massive bar barrier for young people experiencing homelessness. When I was, you know, experiencing or when I was having heat stroke or heat exhaustion or even navigating my disability, I would just go to the ER because I didn't have to pay. You know, I could, I could be in there, I could get my meds there, I could get out, and then ultimately end up with over 50 grand in medical debt. And so that's just like the solution, um, unfortunately, for, for people experiencing homelessness if they don't have a, uh, adequate access to healthcare. And then additionally, while I was experiencing homelessness, I went to the insurance office to get kind of that short-term um, Texas insurance. 
and I was denied five times before I had to go into the case manager to actually be like, look, this young person is actively homeless, give them insurance, and then they were like, oh, damn, makes sense, all right, we'll think about it. Um, so very, uh, very, very common. Okay, and then going into survival tactics and behaviors, recognizing how young people uh, respond, react to certain experiences is important. Uh, so the difference I will mention between survival tactics and survival behaviors would be tactics are kind of the, the methods that young people will go to in order to deal with you know, direct uh, experiences, you know, direct, their direct experience of homelessness uh, in order to kind of not necessarily cope, but just use as a, as a tactic to survive homelessness. And then behaviors being kind of more internalized, uh, it can be like trauma-based, just automatic subconscious response to uh, experiencing trauma and uh, in working to survive. And so survival sex, which we touched on before, um, I won't get too much into, but really just understanding how young people use this um, as, you know, a, just an avenue, a solution to, to get their basic needs met. You know, if you, like I mentioned, like I would do anything to get, to get housed, to get a shower, to get whatever need I needed met, or even to meet some emotional need. And the easiest way was to, to get on a dating app and find someone who would do it. And then that's what ultimately led me into, you know, meeting my exploiter and becoming involved in, oh, excuse me, becoming involved in the life. So that is just such a common, a pathway for young people, especially especially LGBTQ youth and queer youth. Uh, couch hopping, this is what keeps young people hidden from homelessness and is often kind of how young people navigate the experience of homelessness if they can't sustain couch hopping from friends to friends or from other family. Uh, they ultimately stay on the streets, but some people can kind of quote unquote get by and survive by couch hopping. And then there's avoidance. So this is avoiding physical locations, like people, avoiding receiving services. Young people are often mishandled by systems, and so it's common for young people to just not want to be involved in those systems or want to get help for themselves because there is that real reality that they may not be accepted um, in those systems or in those services. And then survival behaviors. So self-medicating, this would include you know, self-medicating with drugs, with alcohol, with sex, uh, to meet any emotional need um, or any other to kind of help soothe ourselves and navigating our trauma. So people experiencing homelessness may take um, stimulants or sedatives to keep them awake in the night um, so that they can survive the night and then go to sleep during the day. Uh, young people may drink in order to cope with um, those intense experiences. Uh, I used to do drugs to, to deal with the heat, and uh, that was something that just, I mean, has impacted me my whole life. And then additionally, wanted to highlight how trans youth may, you know, ex seek out hormones on the black market, or they may have a kind of an exploit or a friend who takes hormones that they may use um, for themselves. And I will recognize that all of these self-medicating medicating behaviors can be helpful in the short term. If they don't have access to adequate care or adequate support, all of those things can create real risks for young people down the line. Um, so really just understanding that this is a behavior to adapt and to survive, rather than just like a choice a young person is making, if that makes sense. Um, Self-isolation. So this can be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to describe it. Um, yeah, just like yeah, like holding up a like holding up a front and not or like not going to seek out services or putting on a mask or just generally isolating yourself from, from other people or from people you're speaking with to kind of protect yourself from any external experiences or pain that may be kind of lingering within systems and kind of, kind of deepen the understanding of how hidden youth experiencing homelessness are. And young people often, or young people who are being exploited, don't want to admit 
with those things or recognize those things for themselves and so they can put that front on and, and kind of isolate in order to survive the experience. Running away, I touched on a little bit earlier, so I won't um, go too much into that, but I will touch on closeting one's identity, which I kept kind of separate from that self-isolation piece. LGBTQ youth may closet their identity in order to survive um, you know, certain situations, whether that's because they've experienced trauma due to coming out, they've been outed by someone in the past, but also you know, other people um, religious, cultural backgrounds may kind of closet themselves in order to not be perceived in one way or another. And we can see that a lot in rural communities, especially in Texas. Hopefully that was clear. Um, I'll pass it over to AC to talk about barriers exiting homelessness in CSA. Thanks, Alex. Okay. So now barriers, so we've kind of talked about, you know, pathways into and like vulnerabilities and risk factors for homelessness and for commercial sexual exploitation. We've talked about challenges while experiencing homelessness, especially among LGBTQ plus youth. And so now we want to touch on, okay, so what about the barriers to actually exiting homelessness, which a lot of times can in some ways be the hardest part, right? So um, it's really important to, to notice that there's a lot of overlap with what we've talked about and also a lot of new challenges that can come up. Um, so the first one we have on here is legal challenges. Um, and so there can be a lot of things that come up as, you know, someone's trying to establish their independence and stability. Um, you know, for example, access to IDs and legal documents um, can be a really big issue, especially for young people who maybe have never had these documents, have never had, had a reliable caregiver who's kept track of them or even gotten them in the first place. Um, you know, and trying, there's the processes to get these documents can be com confusing, bureaucratic, expensive, um, especially for a young person experiencing homelessness. If they don't have transportation, you know, they don't have access to, to documents and really like a full understanding of the process, it can be really hard. I mean, think about even like renewing your driver's license, like it's hard. Um, kind of adding on that, um, something that disproportionately impacts LGBTQ plus youth, especially trans youth, um, is changing your name and your uh, gender marker is, I mean, in Texas, what is it, Alex, like $600, $300? Yeah, it's yeah. it's expensive. It's, it's really difficult, right? I mean, especially in Texas, they don't want you to do it, so they're going to make it as hard as possible. Um, and again, you know, if you don't have someone who can help you, you don't have the time, you don't have the funds, it's, it can be really hard. Um, and they talked about yesterday in the, the session with the Alley Forney Center and uh, Lambda Legal a little bit about that and, you know, kind of how important it is because of, you know, when you're talking to a young person and having to use their legal name on documents that it can be really harmful, especially if we're not doing it, you know, thoughtfully. And so changing their name is a really big part of, of giving them that dignity. Um, uh, also, like Alex talked about, you know, youth with evictions or criminal records can, can face extra challenges to, to exiting homelessness. You know, they may not be able to sign a lease. They may not be able to, to get a job, right? The, like the, in the keynote they're talking about, you know, you have that criminal record and you can get fired. Um, and then this kind of perpetuates itself because if, you know, you have an eviction, you can't get a lease and then that's a really great way, like, to build your credit, right? And so suddenly you finally get that eviction off your record, but you have no credit because you haven't been able to, to prove yourself for, for five, 10 years, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, of course, there's always workarounds with this. Um, you know, there's a lot of amazing organizations out there who help, but it can be hard, it's expensive. You know, and young people experiencing homelessness, they're just trying to survive. You know, they don't necessarily have, have what it takes on their own to do this, and so it's really important that we're giving them those, those services and supports. Um, additionally, um, lack of wraparound services is next. So. When we're, we're trying to help a young person or support a young person to help themselves to, to exit homelessness, um, we have to be thinking about, about the whole person and, and all of their needs and looking at it from a holistic perspective. Um, Alex and I were kind of like working on our speaker notes and just talking about this really casually and, and said something that, that we actually thought hit really well is that it's kind of like, you know, if you have a boat and you've plugged up all the holes but one, there's still a hole in the boat and there's water still going to get in and eventually it's going to sink. And so we really need to be thinking about that from, from the, the entire like holistic perspective. Uh, we'll get a little bit more on that towards the end, but here this is where relationships are key because one provider can't do all of it and we're not asking you to, we're just asking you to be thinking about all of it. Um, kind of building on that is lack of extended care services. So the recovery process and the process of, you know, kind of finding that stability is not linear. It's not for anybody. I mean, I think most kids who graduate, even like, you know, 
kids who aren't systems involved who graduate college bounce back home still, right? So they have that kind of grace and that liberty that, that a young person experiencing homelessness or otherwise in a system might not. Um, and so we really need to be thinking about long term, how are we going to support someone all the way through this entire process, right? You can't just say, okay, like, you're good, you have a job, you have a house, bye, see you never. Um, you have to be there continually, you know, checking in, providing kind of those longer term supports that taper off, making sure that a young person has access to resources if something changes, right? You know, if, you know, oh, you know, I lost the job that I had, where can I go next? Or, you know, I ran into this legal issue or whatever it is, and really making sure that they know where to go, who to call. And then next is healthcare. So without ad adequate healthcare, a young person really can't become their, their full self, right? Like if you're dealing with health issues, that, that takes away from your ability to be pursuing your dreams, from you know, being able to, to work on you know, whether it's your, your record or your jobs or your, your housing or your employment, right? If you're dealing with health stuff, that just takes up a lot of space and a lot of time. Um, and so we really wanted to put that on here too, is that the importance of access to healthcare. Um, kind of leading into that is, you know, difficulty establishing adequate employment. So, um, again, you know, if you have these unmet health, mental or physical health care needs, it can make it really hard to, to have a, a stable job. Um, and then if an employer isn't flexible, if they aren't understanding, you know, if you have things like child care, therapy, or, you know, physical um, considerations, you know, that need to be in mind, kept in mind, um, it can be really, really hard for a young person to to continue to maintain that, that work environment or con continue to maintain that employment. Uh, it's also really important that, you know, they have a work environment that's supportive, that's trauma informed. And, you know, there just aren't always a lot of those kinds of kind of jobs out there. Um, you know, and then on top of that, you know, if a young person has been experiencing homelessness or the child welfare system or something for a long time, they might not have some of that, that formal education or, or some of those like skills that we think of as important. And so, you know, we always want to kind of be thinking about other ways that someone can bring value that, you know, a degree doesn't make you more valuable than someone without a degree, um, but not all employers see it that way. And then the last one is limited options, finding healthy support systems or safe spaces. Um, so this is really just, again, about thinking about that Maslow's hierarchy of needs that everybody has. It's not, they're not asking for, for more or for more than anyone else is. They're just asking to be treated the same as other human beings. And um, when you don't have those supportive systems, when you don't feel safe, it can be really, really hard to, to find that stability. Okay. And then, so building on that, so barriers to exiting the life for CSA specifically. So it's a lot of what we just talked about already, um, but there's you know more factors at play. So the first one on here is really big, is that a lot of times young people just don't know they're being exploited. It just hasn't crossed their mind, um, whether it's because they're you know kind of in a trauma response and they've kind of blocked it or if you know, they believe that they're you know, meeting their needs and, and this is just how it has to be done, um, you know, whatever it might be, that they may just not know that they're being exploited. So that can be a big barrier to exiting is that they don't, maybe they don't even want to give it up, right? Maybe it's like, this is, you know, I'm getting, I have nicer stuff than I've ever had, like I have someone who's paying attention to me, right? And so it can just take a while to really help a young person break down those walls and really understand what's happening to them and, and what they can do. Um, you know, and kind of building on that, Again, inability to meet their basic needs elsewhere. Their exploiters meeting their needs, needs that maybe have never been met in their entire life. Again, that's hard to give up, right? You're saying, no, you have to come here and do this the hard way, you know, get this, um, you know, minimum wage job. They're gonna be like, some, some people may be like, why would I do that? You know, like that just doesn't always make sense, especially at first. Uh, trauma bonds are also really important here. So it's not just that your exploiter might be giving you, you know, meeting needs that haven't been met before, but there's also the, the actual like psychological phenomenon of trauma bonds that can happen when someone's treating you with both you know kindness and harm together. Um, you know it's the same kind of cycle that happens in you know abusive or exploitative relationships where they they the young person starts to feel an attachment to their exploiter. They see them as their their safety. They see them as the person who gives them what they need. And again, like I said at the beginning, and they see us as the providers as the one who's trying to take that away from them. Um, and so it's really really important to to be patient with a young person and to really give them that space and, and build up that relationship, which Alex will talk about in, in just a minute. Um, and then these other ones on here, uh, fear of distrust of other adults or caregivers. Again, I think I talked about that a lot with trauma bonds and, and kind of understanding you know, the situation. And then again, kind of like I talked about on the last slide is making sure that the young person has both wraparound services that meet all of their needs, so not just one or two, but everything 
kind of together to really make sure that they have that stable foundation. And then extended care services. So especially commercial sexual exploitation is extremely complex trauma. And um, it takes a lot of time, patient support to really get, get somebody kind of through that. And even then, you know, years later, someone can kind of have like a, I don't want to call it a relapse, but I can't think of a better word, right? Where they can, some, they can see something or someone that can trigger them and, and kind of um, cause them to, you know, need, need services that they haven't needed in years, right? And so we have to, to know that and, and be understanding of that. So I will pass it to Alex to do a little activity. Yeah, do you know how much time we have? For that? Ten minutes left. We have 15 minutes. Okay, <laughs> we have to go through pretty fast. Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna jump through this pretty quick, um, but I do wanna give an opportunity to kind of go over some solutions, best practices. I love this scenario, or not, I don't love the scenario. It's actually really bad, I'm sorry. Um, but I like this activity because it gets us thinking about uh, how to kind of understand an issue and also work through it as a group. So I, I think in this way, in this sense, we're just gonna read through. Uh, I'll go ahead and read through the scenario. And then folks in the chat virtually, if you wanna kind of engage with us with uh, some of the options. I'd love to, I think it'd be great to see that uh, translated in a virtual space. But for y'all, we'll work through some options if you just want to raise your hand and Charlie can run around and um, you know get y'all's feedback um, as we work through this. So let's get to the scenario. So a 16-year-old boy is kicked out of his grandmother's house after coming out to her as gay. He finds a couple friends to stay with in between being on the streets, but he's running out of options. He later finds an advertisement online for a modeling gig. After the first photo shoot, the photographer says that he knows how the boy can make more money, and he agrees to pose for explicit photos, and then is pressured into explicit videos, which soon leads into having sex with other men for money. After several sessions, he's able to afford a motel room of his own, and he has no idea that he is being exploited. So, very intense. Um, I'll go into this and then we can kind of look back at the scenario activity for frame of reference. And so the first thing we're gonna do is clarify the problem. So we're gonna identify the problems that arise in the scenario. So clearly there's a lot of problems with this. Um, does anybody wanna kind of call out what sticks out to them first or if you have a couple points to make about really what is the issue here? So, uh, you mentioned that there are a lot, so I'm just going to call it the first one, uh, which is family rejection because of mm -hmm. his LGBT identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Other folks? And Charlotte's getting a workout. <laughs> <laughs> um, the young person is either not aware of services that are available or services like places for him to stay don't exist. Right. The young person is 16 years old, a minor, which is, makes them incredibly vulnerable and they are not able to consent for themselves for really anything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, individuals seeing that he's vulnerable and take advantage of him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he also has no idea that he is experiencing exploitation um, in this situation, which can create additional barriers when actually going to receive services, if they were any. Um, and he also is living in his grandmother's house, which means that his parents are somewhere out of the picture as well, so maybe some other like family situation is going on. Yeah, yeah, could have experienced prior trauma. Back here in Charlotte. Staying with friends, so that means that they're homeless. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, clearly there's a, lot, there's a lot at play here, and that really helps us understand the intersectionality of this person um, and how we approach getting services. So the next step in this would be identifying options for this young person. So either thinking through what services you could provide if you're a provider, or even like any advice you would offer if you're a young person um, with lived experience, like what can and or is available in your area, um, or what would you do to approach this situation? So, you know, we'll have a, a few moments to kind of go over what options could be available to this young person. I hate yeah. to do this, but 
the last three slides are my favorite, <laughs> and I kind of feel like maybe we should kind of outline this and then do those slides, and then maybe if we have time, come back. Yeah. What do you think? I'm down for that. Okay. Yeah, cool. Okay, well, so we'll get through this, and then we'll go over the next slides or outline it. Yeah, I think you can, you know, talk about step three and four, but then, you know, we won't do it as a group, maybe. So that's yeah. Kind of, okay. Sorry. Okay, cool. No, that's fine. Um, so on identifying options, um, and appreciate else patient patience, we I like to talk. Um, so identifying the options for this young person, this this activity helps to understand what services are available to this young person. And then additionally, the next step in that is weighing the outcome. So if we were to connect this young person to supports, we then have to understand, you know, how do we work with this young person to help them understand that what they're experiencing is commercial sexual exploitation? How do we screen that young person for that? How are they, you know, how have they been impacted by trauma? Are there any things that we could do that could be re-triggering for this young person? You know, how can we uplift this young person to survive and thrive while also understanding the barriers um, and, you know, the privilege of this young person to, to ultimately provide them with the most adequate wraparound care? Um, and then with that, you can work over the problem again and again until you, you come up with the best solution for any given young person. So, I love this activity, it's super helpful, but we have other content we need to cover. So in providing solutions and best practices, um, we really need to just partner with young people and hear them out, and this, this conference is, is a great platform to understand that. So we should prioritize shared decision making with young people, and this is really, um, you know, uplifting young people to practice self-efficacy and understand, you know, where young people are and how we can provide the most adequate services. And we can do that by maintaining honest and open communication. And so communicating with young people in a way that describes what your the barriers within your services are, what your legal requirements and reporting are, um, and, you know, just being real with young people, being present and being open is crucial whenever we're engaging with young people to make sure that we're really connecting with them um, and to allow opportunities for them to actually trust you because young people you know, have often been mishandled by systems and we need to take that into account as they navigate those. Um, we have to give young people autonomy in their lives. That's a basic human need. Young people need to feel seen. They need to feel heard. Uh, I, I, it's so often said, but when I say we need to give them opportunities to practice their own self-autonomy in ways that are actually safe, because young people could say they chose this life or they chose their experience of homelessness, but how can we give them opportunities to actually practice self-autonomy in a way that's not dictating how they need to live, giving them curfews or you know, creating almost additional barriers. Um, in, in a mindset of like creating self-autonomy. So we really need to be thinking about ways to, to do that. And I can help create a dialogue after this to brainstorm some different ideas as to how we can create that. Um, and then help young people understand what is on the table. So again, like those legal requirements, but also understand what they can and cannot do. Like no service is going to fill all of the holes in the boat, as we mentioned. So we need to make sure that they're connected to services, that they're made aware of other resources or services, and we need to know that as providers. We need to know what's gonna be inclusive for LGBTQ youth and follow through to make sure that we're prioritizing those unmet needs that can be kind of, um, often that go often unmet. We need to provide opportunities for youth leadership uh, and skill building, so, through, um, excuse me, I'm trying to, trying to get to a positive youth development perspective, takes into the whole account of a young person and their life, and this shows um, how young people can you know, really assess the, the aspects of their life, and so we can provide adequate supports, but also provide that, um, those skills for that young person to then build on and thrive and develop, either you know, emotionally develop within their understanding of themselves, but also um, you know, if they wanted to advocate for themselves in the future, advocate for themselves for young people, that we're giving them those opportunities. And they can come in small pieces, or they can be um, kind of, we can dive into those a little bit later. And then, we need to uplift youth voices to ensure services are survivor-informed. 
Being survivor informed is extremely important. Using person-centered language is extremely important. You know, if a young person doesn't identify as queer, as they if they identify as um, another identity or whatever they are, we need to make sure we're respecting that and using the language that they choose to use and then also navigating our own practices and policies to ensure that the services we're providing are going to actually help and not further like compound the issue that young people are mishandled by systems. Because it can take that one experience to continue that, oh yeah, these people aren't gonna actually help me. They're not gonna, they're not gonna have my best interests at heart. And so, yeah, and then ultimately that, that goes all into building trust. How do we establish trust with young people? How do we create supportive relationships in order for them to thrive? And it's really through communicating with them. We gotta talk to young people. We have to you know, assess their needs and we have to be patient whenever we're navigating their lives and often very complex trauma and make sure that they feel supported. And we can have more dialogue um, in a bit, but I do wanna pass it over to Anne Charlotte to, to round us off. Thanks, Alex. Uh, one thing that I do wanna mention on the build trust one that um, just was felt really profound to me was a, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, talking to some young people at a homeless shelter in Houston, and um, there's something that one young woman said to me, which was that she was talking about trust, and she said, it's not that I don't trust you, it's not that I don't trust anyone, it's that I don't trust myself, because everybody that I've trusted so far has let me down, has harmed me in some way, has, has you know, done something to, to make my life worse. And it just like, that just like struck home with me so hard where, you know, she was like, it's not, it's that I don't trust myself because of the, the harm that people have brought me, right? And so we just have to remember that it's not, it's not about you, right? It's about the youth and it's about what they're going through. And it's, it's really about building that relationship with them and, and being them, there for them over and over and over again and showing them that, that you mean it and that you're here because you care about them as a person. So just wanted to make that, that little note there. Um, okay, so next, we talked about partnership. So the next big piece that um, we want to promote is, is this in practices. So the first one is making sure that your intake processes are inclusive of LGBTQIA plus youth and other marginalized identities. Um, so this can be you know, things like displaying visual indicators of inclusivity and safety. It's things like making sure you know, on your intake forms that, that you know, your intake forms are inclusive and you have opportunities to to really talk to a young person about how they identify and, and making sure that your services are fitting that. Um, you know, if you have to you have to write down their like legal name or their birth name somewhere, that you're making sure that that is you know in a small corner at the bottom, and and you're really emphasizing their their chosen name and their their true gender identity, right? And making that the first one. Um, yeah, so it's really just about making that effort to be inclusive, right? And talking to the young person and and really being open with them and, and open to what they have to say. The next one on here is screening all youth, um, ages 10 and up, for commercial sexual exploitation. We recommend the Commercial Sexual Exploitation Identification Tool. It's a universal screening tool, which is really important to, to combat biases. Um, I think there's in a session yesterday, someone was saying they didn't, they saw a program where they weren't even screening um, boys and, and male identifying and, not, and maybe even non-binary youth for commercial sexual exploitation. Um, so we really need to be screening everybody for it, if they're 10 or up, um, so that we're, we're overcoming those biases. Um, the see it specifically that we recommend, it's a research-based tool. Um, it's really quick. It can be integrated within your, your regular intake processes. It's not an interview or anything. Um, it's like a three to four hour training, kind of depending on, on the trainers. Teenoise offers it regularly for free, um, so you're welcome to check out our website or reach out to us even. Um, additionally, okay. So the next one is making sure once you've screened the youth that, that you ha you're doing a comprehensive assessment of what their, their strengths are, challenges, needs, um, personal resources, all of that, so that we can really make sure that we're looking at immediate, medium, and long-term um, processes and what our pl plan is to help this young person achieve stability. Um, you know, a lot of times that means really addressing the, the gaps that, that exploiters are currently filling or trying to fill, right, and making sure that we have a plan in place to to fill those. Um, so strengths and needs to assess, you know, it's things like physical and mental health, substance use, education, legal needs, um, vocational and employment needs, housing, obviously, financial stability, um, you know, family and, and other kind of chosen or chosen or not, um, kind of those support systems that they have in place. What their goals are, 
y'all. Just asking a young person what they want to do, who they want to be, what their goals are beyond, you know, survive, right? That's really important to, to help them achieve those goals. Um, yeah, so things like that. Next, of course, is making sure that your frontline staff are trained to, to address these, the needs of youth, especially youth with complex trauma or with marginalized identities um, or systems involvement. So, you know, making sure that, you know, you have a lot of training on DEI, training on understanding LGBTQIA plus youth and, and how to, to work with them well um, and really meet their needs, uh, training on being trauma informed, um, you know, training on understanding how trauma impacts behaviors, um, how to respond to, to trauma responses, um, being client-centered, you know, uplifting youth voice, youth adult partnerships. There's so many different different topics, but those are kind of the big ones. Um, you know, understanding CSE itself, you know, understanding how to identify it, address it, prevent it. Um, specific curriculums that we recommend are trust-based relational intervention, which we talked about a little bit before, motivational interviewing, uh, positive youth development, uh, youth Thrive, those are all really, really great ones. Um, additionally, with training, something that we hear a lot, right, is like, I know all of that, but then I get in there and it's just, there's, there's you know, it's hard, right? And it's, I, I can know it and I can put it on a piece of paper, but that doesn't mean I'm going to do it. And so also making sure that, that you recognize that this is a really iterative process and that you're working with, with your teams to, to practice, to role play. Role playing can be awkward, but it is so helpful. Um, you know, having town halls or opportunities to talk through, hey, here's what happened and it didn't go as planned, what can we do differently next time? And, and being willing to like talk about, okay, what are the gaps, what kind of training do we need, who can we talk to to, to help us figure this out? So, so really being iterative about it and not just checking the box for your annual training or every other year training, but, but really kind of talking about it as a full team. Um, and then finally, supporting youth with long-term service planning. So we've talked about this a few times. Um, it's, it's not a linear path. Um, stability takes a while. We all stumble. Um, young people who are systems involved often don't have the same grace or you know, opportunities to make a mistake and it not impact them as, as other people do. And so really recognizing that and, and helping a young person plan long-term, um, which really leads into the next slide because a lot of that is about making sure that young people know where to go as you know in the future if something were to come up and we are over time so i'm going to do this one really fast but the last one is collaborating so this is all about knowing who the resources are getting in contact with people in your community um, organizations like national network for youth are great for that right like finding collaborations in texas we have texas network of youth services our organization where our whole job is to support providers and help them talk to each other um, i think there are ones in, in other states too really you know making sure that those relationships are cross systems uh, working together to really understand what that relationship is, setting goals together, knowing how you're going to work together. Yeah, so sorry we went over, but <laughs> thank you guys. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for your time and your space and going over time. Um, I know everyone's super busy, and I just, you know, if you have any questions, we're going to stick around for a little bit longer, and I appreciate you all. And if you have any questions about our organization, please let us know. So thank you so much. <laughs>